In 2019, the FDA released esketamine with more REMS regulation than any psychiatric drug of past. But they left its racemic cousin ketamine practically laying on the table, and online startups are delivering the drug with unregulated speed. Welcome to the Carlette Psychiatry Podcast, keeping psychiatry honest since 2003. I'm Chris Aiken, the Editor-in-Chief of the Carlat Psychiatry Report. And I'm Kelly Newsom, a psychiatric NP and a dedicated reader of every issue. Joyous, mind bloom, new life, wonder bed. These are the hyperbolic names of a new kind of mental health clinic that has cropped up during COVID, at-home ketamine therapy. In early 2020, the DEA issued a waiver that relaxed restrictions in the Ryan Hyde Act allowing clinicians to prescribe controlled substances by telemedicine without ever meeting the patient in person. For patients on Concerta, Ambien, and Suboxone, it allowed treatment to continue as usual, but it also opened up new markets and new modes of treatment. That emergency waiver is coming to an end in May 2023, but we'll be dealing with the after effects for a while. Last month, we covered one of those after effects, the Adderall shortage. Telehealth companies crept up during a lockdown, offering easy access to stimulant medications. Prescriptions rose, but production didn't change. Stimulant quantities are regulated at the factory level, and when a labor shortage hit the main supplier of generic Adderall, the system collapsed, creating a domino effect of shortages throughout the stimulant category. Today, we're going to cover another side effect of the loosened regulation, at-home ketamine. But first, a preview of the CME quiz for this episode. What limits the efficacy of oral ketamine? A. It has a slow speed of onset. B. It has low bioavailability. C. It has a high rate of gastrointestinal side effects. D. It does not contain enough S-ketamine. Ketamine is FDA-approved as a surgical anesthetic, but that's not how it was used in the online-only ketamine clinics that have flourished during the pandemic. The FDA allows off-label prescribing of meds, and ketamine has a sizable evidence base for treatment-resistant depression. Depression is a clinical syndrome, but it's also a universal emotion. The logical conclusion of these facts is that, without regulation, Everyone is eligible for a dose of ketamine from time to time. The surge in off-label use is not just driven by the usual feel-good intentions that drive much of the overprescription of psychiatric meds. There are also valid clinical reasons to prefer ketamine over S-ketamine. For one, ketamine has a large effect size, while S-ketamine's is surprisingly smaller. Several meta-analyses have placed it around 0.3 in the small range. We don't have enough head-to-head data, though, to know if this is a real difference, but animal studies also suggest that they got the wrong isomer when they isolated and branded S-ketamine. The other isomer is R-ketamine, and it's under development for depression, but not currently available at the pharmacy. To give R-ketamine, which is possibly the more potent one, you have to use the racemic ketamine, the original, which is 50% S-ketamine and 50% R-ketamine. Besides the efficacy debate, there is a clear financial difference. Most patients can afford the $5,000 a month cost of S-ketamine unless it is covered by their insurance. And that's just the cost of the med, not the two-hour office visits that are required to deliver it. Oral ketamine can be obtained for $130 a month through online clinics and compounding pharmacies. Public health experts question whether esketamine brings any societal good at this cost. A quality of life analysis in the American Journal of Psychiatry concluded that the cost of esketamine's bravado would have to drop by 40% to justify its cost in treatment-resistant depression. That cost-benefit lag is why the UK health system declined to endorse esketamine in their NICE NICE guidelines this year. These debates are part of why IV ketamine clinics still operate in this bravado era. 
and we have no qualms with IV ketamine clinics. If given responsibly in person for patients who need it, IV ketamine is about as safe as intranasal is ketamine. Some clinics even give IV ketamine at home, but it's still a supervised treatment with in-person meetings. The patients aren't delivering the drug themselves. What does concern us is the rise in oral at-home ketamine clinics. The DEA has strict regulations around the use of esketamine in depression. Patients have to be monitored for two hours after taking it to prevent diversion and abuse, as well as psychiatric and cardiovascular complications. Oral ketamine does not have those requirements, existing in the kind of legal loophole that regulators too often leave open. But what could possibly go wrong with oral at-home ketamine? Well, for one thing, does it even work? The studies with those impressive effect sizes, after all, were done with intravenous ketamine. Now, there are a few small studies supporting oral ketamine and depression, but the effects are less reliable because oral ketamine suffers a bioavailability problem. Only 20 to 30 percent of the drug gets absorbed. In contrast, most psychiatric medications we prescribe, stimulants, benzos, antidepressants, lamotrigine, lithium, they have bioavailabilities over 80 percent, usually over 90 percent meaning that more than 80% of the med gets into their system. S-ketamine, Spravato, has the same limitations as ketamine, and that is why the FDA approved the intranasal form of S-ketamine. By giving S-ketamine through the capillary-rich nasal mucosa, 50% of it gets absorbed, which is more than the 20 to 30% but far short of the 100% bioavailability of intravenous ketamine. Everything that goes into the vein gets into the vein. But what concerns us even more than efficacy is the risk of misuse here. Ketamine is a rewarding drug, which makes it difficult for patients to take reliably on their own. Ketamine was discovered in the early 1960s as a replacement for the first dissociative anesthetic, PCP. PCP at the time was heralded as a wonder drug for surgery upon its debut in the 1950s, but PCP caused too many psychiatric problems for human use, and ketamine came about as a safer alternative. Ketamine is still used in anesthesia, and it did a fine job until supplies started to leak onto the streets. Ketamine use disorders spread in the 1970s, and it is ranked as the number one misused drug in some countries. When the drug ketamine is used for a long time at recreational dosages, like 400 milligrams a day of oral ketamine, it can cause bladder damage, neurotoxicity, psychosis, and cognitive problems. And there are withdrawal problems. These did not show up in the clinical trials of S-ketamine, but case reports are starting to pop up including a recent one in the American Journal of Psychiatry by our Carlat Addictions editor, Noah Capruso. Noah writes that regular ketamine users can experience dysphoria, anxiety, and cravings upon stopping use. And he describes possible withdrawal symptoms of agitation, tremor, sweating, irritability, and insomnia. Last week, the New York Times painted a vivid picture of these problems in an article called A Fraught New Frontier in Telehealth. The Times interviewed over 40 patients and two dozen medical professionals. The doctors they spoke with were confident that oral ketamine was safe and rarely, if ever, led to misuse, perhaps for only one in 1,000 patients at most. But they got a different story when they spoke with the patients of those very same doctors. Some described a compulsive need to take more and more of the medication. They asked for higher doses. Some were prescribed beyond the standard 0.5 milligram per kilogram IV equivalents for depression. Others just raised it on their own or took it rectally to enhance the rush. When they ran out early, they did not tell their physician for fear of losing further refills. Several developed bladder problems, but kept this well-known ketamine side effect hidden from their online physicians for fear of losing access. The details are telling. 
A 50-year-old man now has to use a catheter to empty his bladder. A 37-year-old woman who wears adult diapers. And all the while, they kept taking the ketamine. Some of our own patients may be taking oral ketamine from online providers and not telling us. Perhaps those who could not afford S-ketamine therapy. You can detect it on a urine drug screen, but not the standard one. Ketamine screens need a special order. One comment in the Times article struck me. When asked about abuse, a physician said, just because there's a handful of people that don't follow directions, that does not mean that this medicine is not safe for the rest of the population of competent adults. That sounds a lot to me like the propaganda spread by the opioid industry in the 1990s, citing an informal letter to the editor that appeared in a very formal journal, the New England Journal of Medicine. Industry-sponsored experts back then argued that misuse of opioids was a rare phenomenon among pain patients, seen only in those with pre-existing personality problems, not something that the rest of us needed to worry about. Well, the opioid crisis that sprung from that logic has shown that there is no us and them when it comes to substance use disorders. This is why our field is moving away from stigmatizing words like addiction and abuse, which set up a world where everyone is either a bad actor or a clean and sober citizen. But misuse is something we are all capable of, and people with severe depression are even more vulnerable. Depression does not make people follow directions or take good care of themselves. These are not competent patients who are in need of ketamine, as the doctor described it in his defense of at-home treatment. The Times makes the point that people with severe depression seem drawn to online clinics because of this poor judgment. They want a hands-off treatment where they don't have to interact with anyone or engage in a potentially therapeutic relationship. And that is what they got. Many of these clinics are stocked with pain specialists or primary care physicians rather than psychiatrists. Patients send in rating scales by text and get back computer-generated dosing schedules without any human involvement. It's medicine without the medical care. Some patients describe reaching out for suicidal crisis only to receive automated replies directing them to the National 988 hotline. Ketamine is not a cure for depression. It does not correct any underlying pathophysiology, and it's not known to prevent future episodes. Ketamine works quickly, but we don't know what to do after the relief wears off. We're not even sure if continued dosing is effective. In a meta-analysis of the FDA registration trials for S-ketamine, the drug seemed to lose its efficacy as the weeks progressed and was no different from placebo by week four. Many drugs have been tried to pick up where ketamine left off, including lithium and the ketamine-esque glutamatergics like cycloserine, but all have failed. The only treatment we know of that successfully sustained ketamine's benefits in a randomized controlled trial is cognitive behavioral therapy. And that points to something we need to pay more attention to in psychiatry, the difference between acute and preventative treatment. When someone is having a heart attack, we give nitroglycerin to quickly dilate the blood vessels and blood thinners to stop the clotting. We don't rush in with statins. We use those to prevent heart attacks. Turning back to depression, it's pretty clear that ketamine is an acute treatment. It works within hours and wears off after a few days. Psilocybin and other psychedelics have a similar time course. But what about antidepressants? Antidepressants sit in an uncomfortable middle ground. They are not fast-acting, and they are not particularly robust in their long-term effects either. One of the best studies of antidepressant prevention came out recently in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2021. It was large, around 500 patients, and it reflects the real-world setting because it involved patients who already felt psychologically ready to come off their antidepressant which is the only time that we would consider coming off in practice. So the researchers randomized these patients to either stay on the antidepressant or secretly replace it with a placebo. At the end, the antidepressant group did better, but not by much. 
relapse rates were 39% with continuation of the medication versus 56% with switch to placebo. We see better preventative effects with psychotherapy. In a 2021 meta-analysis from Toshi Furukua and colleagues, psychotherapy was 1.5 times more likely to prevent depression than pharmacotherapy. And a 2000 study of aerobic exercise from Ranga Krishnan's group at Duke pushes the needle even further. They randomized patients with depression to either sertraline or group aerobic exercise. After four months, both treatments worked equally well. But after 10 months, the ones who were trained in exercise were four times less likely to relapse. Not everyone continued to exercise on their own after the group program ended, but the ones who did were 50% less likely to relapse. And that's the approach we need to take with the ketamines, to start the treatment with a clear endpoint in mind and set up that expectation with the patient from day one. Ketamine will get you better quickly, but it won't keep you better. You'll need to do something else to maintain the progress, either active weekly psychotherapy or, say, 45 minutes every other day of aerobic exercise. And just as antidepressants don't work unless they're picked up at the pharmacy, exercise doesn't work either unless the patient makes it to the gym. People rarely exercise on their own. For it to work, they're going to need to join up with friends, get a gym membership, and get a doctor's order. And now for the study of the day. Dr. Aiken is still posting a study a day in his LinkedIn and Twitter feeds. And today's is adjunctive lumetaparone in bipolar depression by Tricia Supis and colleagues. Lumetaparone is FDA approved as Caplida in bipolar depression. But so far, all the studies have tested the drug as monotherapy, which is not how people are likely to use it in practice. This is the first study to test lumetaparone as an add-on treatment in bipolar depression, either the lithium or valproate. Over 500 patients with bipolar 1 or 2 depression were randomized to three treatment arms, lumetaparone 28 mg, 42 mg, or placebo. The FDA-approved dose is 42 mg, but the company recently released lower doses, cutting it in half to 21 mg and again in half to 10.5 mg, which we appreciate because we've seen a lot of side effects when patients start with 42. In this study, the full 42 mg dose separated from placebo with an effect size of 0.3, but the lower 28 mg dose was only marginally effective barely separating from placebo or not at all, depending on the outcome measure. Somnolence, dizziness, and nausea were the main side effects. That makes four industry-sponsored studies of lumetaparone that we're aware of. And here's the score. Two positive, one negative, and one in depressive mixed states, whose results are pending. The bottom line, 42 milligrams is still the target dose for lumetaparone, as lower doses are only marginally effective. And by the way, they don't even make a 28 milligram dose. The next level down is 21 milligrams, and we have little confidence that will work for most patients. Earn your CME credits through the link in the show notes. And if you like this podcast, take a minute to share the link by email or text with a friend, or leave us a review in your podcast store. We read everyone. You can get more unbiased updates through an online subscription and get $30 off with the promo code podcast. Thanks for watching. Hit subscribe if you enjoyed this content. And to earn CMEs for listening, head on over to the carlatreport.com slash podcast.